So we're fortunate to have the privilege and the opportunity to have on today's program Mr. Mark Barnaba, AM private investor, company director. You've had an extraordinary career both here in Western Australia, in, an, in Australia more broadly, but also internationally as well. We'll unpack your, your career and the depth and breadth of that shortly, but I want to understand the Barnaba family history here in Perth and, and perhaps a little bit about your upbringing, if you could. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for... Uh, making your way over here to Perth uh, to speak with me. I appreciate it. So the, the story is simple. Um, both parents immigrated from Italy. My father was born in Milan. He came to Australia in the, uh, the mid-50s, in his early 20s, after the war. Uh, my mother came much younger with her parents. She was four or five when she came over, so they, they met here. You know, we were... A, a typical large Italian family. Uh, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, certainly in Perth. Also, Adelaide had it, Melbourne with the Greeks and the Italians, had very large and, you know, either born overseas or first generation European families. It was a family, I've got a sibling, a Vanessa, a sister four years older than me, and we grew up in a, um, a suburb called Bentley in the east. It, um, it was great youth. I mean, I loved my family. Um, it had its nuances. I mean, back then, you know, I still remember going to grade one at school and, you know, my Italian was much better than my English. So. I remember finding it odd that no one else wanted to speak the language that I was speaking. And, you know, your lunch boxes looked different back in those days. Um, a lot of your, your classmates had a butter and Vegemite roll. You know, I had a thick Italian bread with a, you know, veal cutlet, you know, eggplant, peppers. Now it's very cool. Back then, it probably wasn't as cool, but very tasty. So it was, you know, it, it it had its um, advantages, but what it did teach you was diversity. You know, I am first generation Italian. I was born here, I regard myself as Australian, but it, it taught you diversity. You, you understood a different culture, you spoke a different language, you had to think about assimilation, about integration. And even with my wife Paige, her uh, father came to um, Australia Keith when he was about 10 or 11 from Holland, um, paid his grandmother, um, he's still alive today, she's 102, um, here in, in Australia and as a result my family unit, Paige and myself, the, the two kids, Arabella and Luca, you know they intuitively understand diversity, they, they have met their family in Italy, they've met their family in Holland, um, they are clearly Australian, but they have got a broad eye for the rest of the world. So I regard, Rob, those early years as having conferred upon me advantages and just something different which allowed you to see the world in a different way. Tell me about the influence and, and the impact of your parents growing up. Uh, strong values, strong Catholic values. What did you learn from them that you've that you've carried through? You know, there's enormous sacrifice when you leave a country like my father did at 24, and you know you decide to start afresh, and you are making, you are leaving behind everything you know. You're leaving behind back then. You know, you even something simple like a phone call was nearly prohibitively expensive. You know, if you go back to the 60s and early 70s, and certainly it was years before, you know, it was, it was feasible economically, everyone would hop on a plane and go back. So, you know, what do you learn? You learn what sacrifice entails. Uh, you understand what it means to have a broader family unit. You understand the value of hard work because it requires enormous hard work. Uh, you know what it's like not to take simple things for granted because a lot of the simple things just weren't there. So it, um, 
it makes you very grateful because you, at some point, parents make very big sacrifices for their kids and you know they can make life for their children, for my sister and myself, much easier. And it's always, I think, provided the perspective for me that you have to grow, you have to work hard, you really need to give it the best shot. This hasn't been provided to everyone. It was built on sacrifice and hard work. You have to give it a crack. I want to ask you about your education, as I understand it, from grade four up until the completion of high school. You attended Trinity College in East Perth, graduating in 1980. You're uh, quite into business and, and into the academic subjects, but you're also a, a, a real tennis champion of the school, if I recall correctly. Tell me about Mark Barnaba as a, as a student at the time. So, at some point, you know, I look back and it's always difficult to know when it was, but probably I think about year eight or nine, you know, it became obvious I was, I was good academically. Um, it was something that for the amount of time I could put in, you could get a big return from it. And Rob, I enjoyed it. I, I loved maths. I, you know, really enjoyed the sciences and I enjoyed economics. So. Studying hard wasn't a hassle. You're in, you like it and you're not bad at it. That's usually a good combination, right? So you kind of wake up and you think, well, this is okay. I was very lucky. I had you know, some very good mates at school, um, two particularly close friends, Brad and Graeme, and you know, both capable, um, both played good tennis, um, both bright and, you know, have both have done extremely well in life. Um, so I think meeting capable friends that also push you, that's, that's a big plus. But, you know, I, I, it's hard to look back and reinvent how you thought, but I, Trinity College was not cheap. Um, it required, again, you know, kind of sacrificed by your parents. And I just thought there's an obligation somewhere along the line to give it your best shot. And, and I enjoyed it. Tennis, um, look, we had a team then which was much more um, kind of a, a group of equals. I, I might, you know, maybe I was the first among equals, but um, we're all pretty much the same. And it was, it was really good fun. So uh, high school was terrific. It was a Christian brother school. So back then, maybe 30% of the staff were lay staff. 60, 70 percent, certainly in the early years, would have been Christian brothers. So very different than today. You know, you kind of went to church every week. You know, I went to confession every week. I must have had a lot to confess, um, clearly. So, you know, it was different. It was typical of the time, but I loved it. My memories of high school are terrific. And it, you know, it really did set me up well for, for later years. I should add, you were you were ducks of the school, so obviously you had those foundations then to, once you'd completed high school, move into university. As I understand it, you initially looked at a science degree and dabbled in that for a couple of months and then moved into a business and commerce degree at the University of Western Australia. Uh, why the initial interest in science, and I think even before then medicine to some extent as well, and then why why the shift to business? It's, it's as simple as, at least back then, if you you know, got a high score at high school and you were doing the sciences, physics and chemistry, you, I don't know, you defaulted to things like medicine. You know, right before university, I said, look, I didn't take me long. I effectively decided this doesn't work for me. I, I um, wasn't particularly good with, you know, the sight of blood, Rob. So I, it, it, it worked its way through that this was not meant to be my chosen field. So I stayed in, I moved to the science faculty, I stayed in science um, and I was majoring in physics and, uh, and maths and I loved it. It was great. Um, after a year I woke up and kind of thought, I'm probably not going to be a physicist nor a mathematician. Um, I had done uh, one or two units in the commerce faculty and thought, I love this and it makes sense. and kind of at that point when I moved into commerce economics it was 
it was a duck in water. Um, it was clearly what I should be doing. Loved it. Had very good faculty there that, you know, in a particular a few very senior staff that were both world class and terrific. And it was another, you know, I just loved it. It was a great experience. Clearly, as you said, you, you did enjoy it. You graduated in 1985 with first class honours and won the J.A. Wood University Medal for the best student at the entire university. What were your experiences at UWA like? And, and once you'd sort of uh, figured and found, found your feet at the university, where did you see your career taking off? Did you have an inkling towards one certain subsect or another? Yeah, um, so I was still living at home uh, when I was at university. I mean, typical ethnic family. You know, your parents worked to keep you at home as long as you could, um, which, which uh, was great. So, look, if you wanted to do well, you, you still studied hard. So there was, a, there was a fair quota of focus on the academics in those years, which was absolutely fine by me. You know, for about half that time, I kind of, you know, I had a relative serious girlfriend, as, you, as serious as you do, I suppose, in those early years. But um, that was good. I still played sport, mostly tennis. Where it got to, though, was by the final year, the honours year, I quickly established that you know, I, I just needed to expand the horizon. Um, and the expand the horizon was to shores that were beyond Australia. I, I tried to define it, I couldn't. And I, you know, I asked myself the question, well, how do you think about that? And the way I thought about it was, you know, where you want to be is where the best are. And for what I did, that was America and it was going to somewhere like Harvard Business School or Stanford Business School or Chicago or MIT. Um, so that's what I set my sights on and um, I applied. I was fortunate enough to get a, a scholarship which paid for about half. Um, my first choice was Harvard. I mean, I was young, I applied when I was 21. I was over there, I was 22, so we're going back to the mid 80s, Rob, it was, you know, and I hadn't traveled much, but the issue was these places are expensive. Um, you didn't have student loans back then, so I still had a, a gap to fill. Um, and I was fortunate at that point, if you go back to the mid 80s, um, we had just won the America's Cup, you know, Alan Bond, an entrepreneur from Perth, was riding high. I had gotten some press uh, in Western Australia for doing well at university and for being accepted into, kind of into Harvard. And he called to see me, he literally called. My phone, hello Mark, it's Alan Bond, would you come and see me? You know, when you're 21 and you're sitting in an office and you get a call like that, I naturally thought it was one of my mates. Um, so I, I did not for one minute think that it was really Alan Bond. So I was quite um, blasé. Of course I can, Alan. Um, towards the end of the phone call, I realised it clearly was him. I was more polite. I went and saw him, but his first comment was he really appreciated how kind of, you know, I, I, I stood up myself and how uh, mature I was for that first part of the conversation and I wasn't overawed and I kind of look back and you laugh at it because you think if I'd known it was him I would have been very different. In any event uh, Bond Corporation provided the other half of the financing on the condition that I came back and worked for two years I went off to Harvard. Speaking of your experiences at Harvard some years later, you said going to a place such as Harvard expands your horizons and takes you out of your comfort zone. I was mixing with a completely different set of people from a variety of cultures. Once you'd got to Harvard, 
Walk us through some of those experiences. What did you find when you got there? Were you one of the youngest? I presume you were at sort of only 22 years of age, straight into an MBA degree, of which particularly nowadays is unheard of. People do it in their 30s and, and late 30s. What did you find when you got to Harvard? So there were about 1,000 people um, in each year. Um, so I was a single youngest person. So that's kind of good to get treated as the baby. I, I think in my year group, maybe... Rob, there were you know eleven or twelve Australians. Um, I was the only from West, the only West Australian. Probably about forty percent of the the class were international, from everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. A lot of Japanese, a lot of Brits, a lot of Europeans. You know, average age probably on entry was twenty seven. You quickly learnt was just everyone's the same. <laughs> you know. It is, you can easily get overawed, um, but there was great camaraderie. People have got the same set of issues, which is how do we get through this thing, um, through these two years. It, you know, it really did teach you to have to work together because you were given much more work than you can do on your own. So it kind of forced the students to have to work together, especially for the international students, you learn a lot about the world. The Americans learnt through the rise of their, their, you know, foreign colleagues, or the rest of us, but we were actually living in another country. Um, probably the one thing it really did help was just the realisation that you can match it with the best. So you can be from Timbuktu, you can be from... You know, Darwin from Perth, from you know, from any any area of any country. But if you're good, you can be good internationally. Now, it, it does give you a degree of sophistication. It does give you a degree of polish. It it verses you in a in a sophisticated language system for business. So there are lots of things it does give you, but I left no longer wondering, can I do okay? It was, you know, you can clearly do okay. You know, you're not the smartest, you're not the dumbest, but you can do okay. It then comes down to figuring out what that is and how do you do it. So you return to Perth post Harvard and commence employment for Bond Corporation. What happens next? So my role was executive assistant to the chairman, Alan. Um, so I travelled a lot with him. You know, I was 24, um, 25, uh, long on a lot of good academic knowledge, short on practical experience, but, but you learn quickly. It was remarkable because Alan Bond then was seeing heads of state, CEOs. I mean, we met with Margaret Thatcher. We we had a meeting with Donald Trump. Not that Donald Trump acknowledged I was there, but that's okay. Um, it was, if you remember the Chilean dictator, General Pinochet, we went and had a meeting with him. You know, we, you travel the world and met truly fascinating people. So for that first year, I was pretty much a glorified bag carrier is a better way to describe it. But a fun bag carrier, um, and I learnt even more about the world. So when I combined that with the twos at Harvard, I had a period where, you know, I, felt, I then felt that I really understood the world. It was a short-lived experience because before the completion of the two years, Bond went into liquidation, um, and I was out of a job. Obviously, during this time, and, and you sort of touched on it there, Perth and more broadly, Western Australia was undergoing a significant economic boom. How infectious was it sort of having first-hand experience of, of these business conditions and particularly working with Alan Bond? And, and what were some of the lessons that you take away from, even though it was a short period of time from those two years working with him? Well, entrepreneurs need to know how to take risk. So, you know, he knew how to take risk. He employed very good people. Alan Bond was only ever good to me, um, so you know I I want to respect the fact that he was both generous and and always 
you know, kind of fair and reasonable with me. You can, look, you can make mistakes in business, and we all do, and not everything that you do is going to work. What you can't do is kind of flip the coin too often when, if it lands the wrong way, you're betting the farm. And if you do that a few times too often, it can come unstuck. I mean, Bond Corporation had a lot of debt. There are a number of businesses that were under pressure. It paid top price in a heated market for assets. And if you, well, Rob, you, you, you won't remember, but you will have read what happened to interest rates during that period. You know, they, in the late 80s, the cash rate in Australia was double digit. It was 13, 14%. So when that happens, it can all unravel pretty quickly. And there was really no plan B. How to get out of this. So um, a very good friend of mine always, you know, has taught me over the years, you have to have a plan B. You have to have a plan A. It's a plan you go for. Plan B is your second rock solid plan that you fall back on if plan A doesn't occur. And it's probably good to actually have the soft undertakings of a plan C. At Bond, we, you know, we fell short of having a, a watertight plan B. A lot, look, a lot of things did, did happen that you could call, you know, bad luck, global crash, a recession, interest rates, but um, that's where it found itself. Let's then talk about the career change that you made post Bond Corporation to McKinsey and Company, and in particular working in their London office. Why McKinsey and, and why consulting? So I had been, I'd been seconded whilst at Bond to a number of the investment banks um, on deals. So I'd, I'd had quite a, a stint in banking, in investment banking, um, in that two year period. You know, I felt like my undergraduate degree, my honours year was in finance at business school at Harvard. You know, I kind of majored in e economics and finance. Bond was, especially when I was seconded to work on deals with some of the US banks, was finance. Rob, I just felt that I just needed to do something else. It, um, and I wasn't trained as a lawyer, I wasn't, so, it was limited as to what else I could do. Secondly, I did feel like I'd missed some of the foundations that many others had. So often when you go to business school, before you go, you'll have done two years at McKinsey, two years at a Goldman Sachs after you've done your undergraduate. Two years, three years, you know, in your first job as an engineer, as a doctor architect, whatever you're doing. Um, and then your first job after business school, you know, you're usually starting at the bottom and doing analysis and spreadsheets. And, and I felt like I had none of that. So I did feel like it was time to kind of say, Mark, it, this may be the time to take one or two steps back for five steps forward in five years time. And I felt the urge that especially by this point, I again needed to just move out of Australia. Um, I hadn't spent that much time in London. McKinsey's London office was one of their most successful offices. Um, I was lucky enough that they took me in and it was fantastic. You spent five years at McKinsey in the London office, then the Johannesburg office, I think, for a period of time, and then ultimately in the Sydney office. What were some of the engagements or projects that you worked on during that time that you remember most fondly? You remember the projects and you remember the people. You know, I worked with some brilliant people. Um, a partner that's now retired, David White, here in Australia, um, someone who's still one of my closest friends, Bryant Plasvik. You know, you worked with, with really capable people and you worked with, you know, at a very young age, very senior management teams, the CEO often. A lot of my projects were in mining, you know, so it kind of really kicked my mining career. Um, Billiton, BHP, Woodside, um, in energy, 
uh, AMP in financial services. They range from strategy pieces to cost reduction. Um, the variety was incredible. <laughs> you know, you, you, all you had was your training and your, your ability to think um, and work hard, because it was, it was work, hard work. But, you know, I, I can't speak of what McKinsey's like these days, but, you know, back then it was just a fantastic organisation to get training at. And I, you know, it, it was a wonderful five year period. But again, I kind of, at that stage, did the reverse, Rob. I, um, I was in my early to mid thirties. I had now spent the better part of a decade floating around. Um, I had family back here in Perth, um, friends, and I, I really felt like it was, it was time to make a call as to where I wanted to really break the back of my business career. Um, I also felt, Rob, that I'd, I'd done my apprenticeship. You know, very good high school, UWA, Harvard, kind of seconded to some banks during that period, McKinsey, all around the world. Many would have done it prior. I was probably more conservative. I kind of, you know, and I thought, Mark, you have to stop kind of accumulating brands, you know, like you're insecure. You know, you, you need to now decide, I've had all the training, I've, you know, I'm a Jedi now, go out and figure out what you're gonna do with it. Um, so that was a period where I kind of said, I'm stopping and I, I formed my f first firm. And that firm, of course, was GEM Consulting alongside John Poynton in and around about 1996. How did the relationship with John come about and what was the focus of GEM Consulting? So John and I had been mates right back from when I was at university. You know, John was an extremely successful um, business person here in Western Australia. Um, I was always grateful because he would pop over every now and again <laughs> to Harvard and catch up with me and, uh, and drag me out for a meal, which we always used to kind of laugh at. But I had formed a very strong relationship with a number of McKinsey associates, uh, Bryant Plasvik, John Peacock, Errol Levitt and Jeff Rasmussen. And we spoke about starting something um, what we didn't have in a market like WA was just the connectivity. You know, and someone that had, you know, John was, you know, 13, 14 years older, was extremely well connected, and that combination worked well. Right, I mean, it, it was a, from, from the get-go, it was just one of those um, startups that flourished. I mean, we, we were virtually profitable immediately. It grew quicker than virtually we could manage it. Um, we opened a Sydney office. Um, it had two parts to it, a management consulting part and an investment bank, bank, banking part. I had never worked that hard in my life. You know, you became the head recruiter, the uh, head client winner, the, you know, head work, and this was everyone, not just me, the head, work on your project, you know, as well for eight or 10 hours a day. Do the accounts on the weekend. I mean, everyone did everything. Um, there are good days though, you know. <laughs> I often look back and you think, you know, how do you do it? And sometimes youth and naivety, not knowing how hard it could be, are wonderful shields to stop you not doing things. Because if you knew, and you look back through your, your older eyes, you think, I'm not sure I want to do that, but it worked. And clearly the, the hard work paid off. The business was acquired some five years later by AST Group out of South Africa in a, in a purported $44 million deal. You've spoken previously about the financial freedom that that deal gave you. To what extent did you see the next chapter coming about though? I think you, between 2004 to, sorry, 2001 to 2004, you had a break and you were still working at the firm, but then there was Azua Capital, but 
which we'll get to shortly. But what were the next steps in your business career, given the rapid success of that of that company? Equal largest shareholder in the in the firm. That number you mentioned was a number of 23, 24 years ago, right? So inflate that for today. So um, you wake up in your 30s and you kind of think, well, okay, that, that part of my life, financial security is now resolved in a manner that I never expected it would be. So you think, what do I do now? Um, and it was good and bad. It was good because yes, I, I, I fully understand that that's a lovely thing to happen, but it nearly solved the problem way too early in life where, where you think, okay, well, what does it mean? What does it mean for what I do? And look, I, I did, you know, I took a break. I, I spent quite a bit of time during those years with my extended family um, in Italy. Um, we still had an earn out. Um, when the earn out finished, uh, made sure that the firm transitioned well. And then effectively we took just the, we, we left the management consulting part, which, which effectively is still being led and run by today by one of the individuals, uh, Robert Radley, that you know, we, had, we had worked with in our early years. And we took the investment banking part, which became the new Azure Capital. And one of the very first people there was, you know, Simon Price and Simon's a managing partner at it today. So great longevity. They're doing extremely successfully both in Sydney and here in Perth. Grew it. That went well. But at that stage, I started doing other things. I got involved in, uh, in football, in other, other external interests. And it kind of led by 2009 that I felt it was time that, not so much just for Azure, but for that part of my life, from Gem to the end of Azure, which was probably a, a 15 year period, I felt I've done that now. And, you know, Rob, I always felt that you, if you're not growing, you're, con you're contracting basically. I mean, you either, you either find a way to grow or you are shrinking. And I could feel that the growth was now limited. And I just ha had to find a way to re keep reinventing myself. Let's talk about one of those other interests that you involve yourself in, and that is as the chairman of the West Coast Eagles Football Club during the period 2007 up until 2010, a, a turbulent time for the club. What did you do when you took on that role? What, was some of the, what, what sort of club did you walk into and how did you go about the transformation process? So look, important to say that, you know, I was a very average footballer. Um, at Trinity, we had the first, second and third 18, and I took great pride in playing for the third 18. Um, so I knew football, but clearly I was not there for my, um, my actual football acumen. Uh, I'd been on the board for a while, I'd been deputy chairman for a while, but as history has it, you know, we, um, the club uh, had a number of cultural issues at the time. Um, one of the purported issues was, you know, drug use. Um, more so though, it, some of the, you know, what you thought the issues were really more wrapped up in the fact that you know, the, the fabric of the club just wasn't, I think, what it was five or 10 years prior. And that can happen. Good people, but it can happen. And um, within the first few weeks of taking that chair role, I, you know, had to terminate the contract of Ben Cousins. Um, you know, an individual I still think very highly of today. Uh, you know, difficult decision and difficult for the club. So. If you remember the, the Gillard report, Justice Gillard had a report on the integrity of the club and did the West Coast bring the AFL into disrepute. We, we you know, managed to demonstrate that that wasn't the case. But it was, a, it was a line in the sand experience because effectively as a club within a short period of me taking over, we, we had to make a decision and communicate it, which is, look, 
the winning at all costs, which we're good at, does not actually give you a, a social license to operate. And we've, we have lost our social license to operate. We are no longer, you know, favoured and respected by uh, our members, by our state, by the AFL. We need to fix that. And quite frankly, we need to put that ahead of winning. Putting anything ahead of winning in a football club, especially one like West Coast, was, you know, was regarded as, um, as you know, a complete paradox. Um, so it was not a straightforward period. Um, you know, I take great pride in it though. In 2010, we won our first wooden flag. We finished last, we won four games. Two years later, we were playing finals. So we decided we we're going to rebuild. Two years later, we were playing finals. Um, played a, then I played a preliminary final. By 2015, we we're in a grand final. We lost it by 2018. We played a, a grand final and we won it. So, you know, we, we turned the club around. That's why even today, West Coast are not having a particularly good season. You know, I've got a lot of confidence in that club because uh, it is a club that does actually know how to take medicine and turn itself around. But it, it taught me a lot. It was a completely different industry. You had to figure out how it worked. It was a role which was much more about leadership and organisational change. Um, good thing to have done once. Not, not necessarily sure I'd want to do the same thing again, but a good thing to have done once. Let's talk about some of the other roles that you've held in your corporate career. In 2012, you were appointed Chairman of Macquarie Group Western Australia, Chairman and Global Head of the Resources Group and Chairman of Corporate and Asset Finance Group. You held those roles for some six years. Take us through the, the strength of the Macquarie business once you were actually inside there. What did you find when you were appointed to those roles and, and what were some of the key learnings? So I'd, before that, I'd, you know, I was on a whole bunch of boards. I was chairman of Western Power, which is one of the utilities here in Perth. Um, at the time, I was just taking the chair role of uh, the State Theatre Company of Western Australia. I was on the board of Fortescue with Andrew Forrest. And again, I felt I needed to do something different. And um, through Nicholas Moore that we had known each other um, from many years back. In fact, one of the first projects in GEM was Woodside and I had met Nicholas during that. So, you know, very generously, the, the offer was to come and work, report directly to Nicholas and have a, a portfolio of roles. Um, very global do it from Perth as long as I was happy to fly a lot. And again, very unique culture. I mean, the best organisations uh, usually have truly unique cultures. They're different. The culture of Fortescue is different to the culture of Macquarie, different to the culture of, you know, McKinsey. But for their industry, they're really unique, Rob. They, they define the best in class for their industry. And Macquarie was that. It was... Um, Truly outstanding people. Uh, it, you know, Nicholas was a just a world class CEO, um, and you look at Macquarie. I mean, it's had five CEOs: David Clark, uh, Tony Berg, Alan Moss, Nicholas, and Shamara over over more than fifty years, and not many organisations can manage to do that. Um, and what I did do is I pretty much said to myself at, during that period, there are only two things I really want to do. Um, I want to, uh, you know, really give Macquarie a go. Um, but I said to Nicholas, there's just one board that I do want to stay on, um, and that's Fortescue. And that was very important to me. Um, I... Uh, I had worked with Andrew many years before I joined the board and we can come back to it, but you know, Macquarie was very good in letting me do that. And then I left in late 17, went 
I kind of, the reserve bank opportunity came up, which meant that I, I effectively had to leave. I just want to touch on your uh, board role with Fortescue Metals Group Limited, which commenced, I think, as you said, in 2010, and then you've since added to those roles with your appointment as lead independent director in 2014 and then deputy chair in 2017. How did your involvement with Andrew come about? And uh, Take us through that sort of journey from joining the board in 2010 to then the increased responsibility in 14 and 17. Sure. Um, Rob, so Andrew went to UWA two years before me. When he was finishing and I was um, kind of starting, we had met. We got a, a very good friend in common, uh, a couple of very good friends in common, even back then that you know we still spent a lot of time with uh, Mark Paganin and and Tony Grist and then Andrew then I left and went away Andrew went to Sydney met Nicola but then by the mid to late 90s he came back we uh, with Anaconda Nickel Andrew kind of some cost reduction work we got involved and then at the start of Fortescue once it had started again in an advisory sense he started bringing me in so the board role emerged from um from a corporate role um in a banking sense so you know probably got very actively involved by about 2006 with andrew again um and it's been one of the great relationships and um and events in my life. You know, Fortescue was just a very unique organisation. Um, very unique set of values, very unique culture. It is now looking to kind of change the world again with green and renewable energy. Um, if anyone can do it, it is Fortescue, I think, and Andrew. And just a, you know, a terrific, Friendship and relationship, um, it is a, you know, it's a, a strong independent board. It's now in a new stage where, as you know, just, you know, recently had two new appointments as CEOs, Mark Hutchinson and Fiona Hick. But that has been a, um, a really privileged part of my working career. And take us inside the growth of the company over the past decade in particular. Clearly, the board and the executive team have had to navigate the turbulence in, in economic markets and, and in, in the political cycle as well. What have been some of the challenges during that time? <laughs> Look, you go back about a decade, um, you know, there was a period, Rob, where Fortescue had a lot of debt and the, the ratio of debt to market capitalisation was two to one. Now, I remember saying to Andrew one Friday, you know, Andrew, our, our net, our gross debt to market caps just passed a ratio of two to one and there aren't many companies that ever get to this ratio and still survive. <laughs> Typical Andrew goes, so Mark, how happy are you that you're going to be on one of the first ones that does survive? <laughs> um, I thought to myself, you know, the guy's indefatigable, right? You know, you can't, you just, his self-belief is remarkable. Um, you look today, gross debt is, you know, several billion dollars, three to four, and the market cap is $65 billion. So, um, just a remarkable story of, of success. You, know, you, you only have to go back um, eight, nine years and you know, our C1 cost, the direct mining cost with $45 a tonne. Today, they're, they're still very, very, very sub $20. Uh, and we had them down to 12 or 13 even with inflation. So, you know, just a, a remarkable Western Australian success story. It is no longer just a Western Australian company, it's a great Australian company and now 
global and I take enormous pride in what Fortescue is looking to do globally. I mean, it's taking on climate change. It is looking to, um, you know, help greenify the planet via renewables and energy. If someone doesn't lead that fight, who does? You know, what do we eventually do? Just wait for someone to stand up tall. So, and I think Fortescue is doing it in a manner where it's, you know, is demonstrating, is demonstrating that it can be done profitably, Rob. So, you know, uh, that's the ultimate compelling argument. This can be done for the good of the planet and in a compelling manner. So, so that is that has been a good journey. That then brings us to your role as board member of the Reserve Bank of Australia, to which you were appointed in 2017 and then reappointed in 2022. Clearly through this role you'd get such an enormous macro view of Australia's economy. What, what are some of the more, say, interesting aspects of the economy that, that perhaps some people that are not in that position wouldn't be exposed to? Um, well, that's a good question. Look, you know, be on the board of your country, Central Bank, great privilege. You know, it's a terrific institution and it's got remarkably capable people. Very highly regarded overseas. So, you know, what are some of the things you learn for a country like Australia? How you do in your own country um, is probably 50% of it. How the rest of the world does is about the other 50% of it. I mean, you know, we are a small country by percentage of GDP of the rest of the world. We're a very open trading country in terms of net imports and net exports. Our exchange rate, for example, fluctuates much, much more than the average exchange rate. We're okay with that. We've figured out how to deal with that. Most countries would not be able to deal with that. Highly regarded, you know, we've had a remarkable 30 year period. You know, our GDP per capita is one of the highest in the world. Um, even today, you know, our core inflation rate, Rob, is still above the average of many other of our kind of comparable countries. And yet our cash rate is lower. Our unemployment rate is still, you know, very low compared to the rest of the world. So we have done, you know, we have done well. Um, property prices here have you know, been a real generator of wealth, that's good and bad. If you're, you know, if you're trying to get into the market, we have to think about how do we find a way to allow our youth to acquire property. But I think what you learn is you kind of spend more time in your own economy and through the eyes of the Reserve Bank, have a look at the demographics, the economics, issues of equality in the rest of the world. You just realise how good a country we live in and that because we're all here, we take it for granted somewhat. You know, if you're only, if all you did was live in heaven your whole life, it's hard to not realise that not everyone else is like heaven. I'm not saying we don't have issues. I'm not saying that there aren't things that we have to deal with. But, you know, this is a remarkably good country to live in. It is well governed, well managed. Even through an organisation like the Reserve Bank, you understand that, you know, we have a keen sense of of fairness, being egalitarian, fair go. It's just a, it's an odd comment to make through what you would think is a, an economic institution, but you actually get to unwrap a lot of how your country thinks through the eyes of a central bank where you're trying to make decisions on what is a decision for the welfare of the Australian public, which is one of the, the core mandates of the bank. So. Um, and you know, the last few years have been an interesting experience. Pre-pandemic, the world was just doing terrifically well. You've got a pandemic, the world falls apart, you have to drop rates, you've got quantitative easing. You wake up the next day and there's inflation. And you think, now we have to up rates and deal with inflation. And we have to do that at a quicker pace than we've actually ever done before. Um, and then there's a, you know, bank inquiry while you're trying to stabilise where you're at. So it's probably one of those periods where in six years, you know, you could have been on there for 16 years and not have had that experience. So great privilege and um, it's been fascinating.
Just a quick one on, on those six years. As you said, the arguably uh, the most disruptive period in Australia's history, particularly those COVID years. How challenging was that, particularly in sort of March, April 2020, when nobody knew what was happening, when you're meeting a reserve as a Reserve Bank board? What were we staring down as a country at that time? It's easy to say you're making, Rob, decisions under uncertainty, but that is like being in the dark. I mean, you, you can't get economic data from which you can easily predict. You can't even really have accurate data on what's happening with consumption. The sand is changing under your feet. The issue is you still have to make a decision. You, and one of the things you do have to do is be calm and measured and try and actually help a situation where fear and, um, and chaos can easily reign and try and int introduce an element of, of structure, calmness and confidence. And that's what you actually have to try and do. I mean, you, as difficult as it is, you know, within about six months, the picture was a little clearer. All the central banks spoke to one another. The ability to share information made it a lot easier. No one could have predicted that by late 2021, the world could have changed as quickly as it did. But it did. Um, it has taught me. Predicting, you know, I, I only attach so much value to. When someone tells me, you know, these people are fantastic. They've got a, an iron ore prediction for the next three years. I'll always make the comment, all we know is that that would be wrong. We know nothing else other than I can get 10 predictions on iron ore prices. I can get 10 predictions on exchange rates. And, you know, now it doesn't mean that you don't forecast. It doesn't mean that you don't um, glance out to the rest of the world, but hubris, lack thereof, is a really important quality. I mean, being humble enough to know the limitations of what you can do, and in fact, what we are good at, is absolutely critical. As you know, there's been consistent criticism of, of the RBA over so many decades, but in particular over the last couple of years. But one of the issues that perhaps hasn't been spoken about, but that should be, is the composition of the board when you look at people with genuine practical business experience, I think you're one of only two on the board that offers that. Is that a fair assessment, do you think? Oh, Rob, let me answer that tangentially. You know, my experience with the Reserve Bank is that it, it's got tens and tens and tens of uh, world-class economists. And even on the main board, uh, there are Nearly half of the board has a PhD in economics or a master's degree. So having lots of very well-trained economists, I never felt that it was, it was a skill lacking. What the broad always brought was a different perspective and a different set of skills, understanding how to make decisions under uncertainty, understanding how to analyse complex data. And the mix has been valuable. So. I can only comment on what I have seen, but uh, it's functioned as an objective, independent, um, well-heeled board that I think in retrospect has guided Australia in a relative sense compared to the rest of the world to a good spot. The facts would suggest that. So. One full review took place. All organisations should review themselves. You don't grow without feedback. It, it would be nonsensical to suggest that not having a review is not valuable. And many of the things that have been um, raised in the review, I'm sure at, at the margin will improve the organisation. They should. Like all reviews, we'll do it. Um, and, and that's a positive, but you know, a team that wins a grand final should undertake a review. Can they play better? I'm sure they can play better. But they may have been playing good football to begin with. They can just play better. 
A couple of quick uh, questions to finish because I know you've got a, a board meeting to chair. Key lessons or learnings for success, what have they been? Treat people with respect, be humble, really work hard, don't give up, be very open to opportunity. When it, when it comes knocking, run down every avenue because you just don't know which rabbit hole is going to be the one that, that leads you to success. Having a plan is good, but, you know, life is actually what happens while you're planning for it. So, you know, having a plan is good, but you actually have to just get out there and, um, and do it and have a focus on growth, Rob. I mean, if you, if you don't feel you're growing, if you don't feel like you're not tearing the fabric of your own makeup a little bit that feels uncomfortable, that allows you to continue to grow muscle, you'll atrophy. That's kind of how it works. I mean, you don't want to push yourself so uncomfortably that, you know, you, you tear yourself to pieces. But the flip is if, as we said, if you're not growing, then atrophy is occurring. And, you know, how you do that, I think is really important I, you know i'm a big believer that you want to find things in life that you you enjoy you enjoy the people you do them with i think one of the great luxuries as you get older is a lot of decisions you make are on the quality of the people with whom you do it you know you you have more of a luxury to do that and good people usually you know end up delivering good outcomes you just have to pick those good people. Qualities for effective leadership. You've been a leader and now you've got observations of leaders in organisations through your chairmanship and, and directorship roles. What are some of the common traits that, that leaders have or should have? Everyone's got their own leadership style. We can debate forever a leader's born or made. I think it's a bit of both. I think you become a better leader the more you lead. I think you become a better manager the more you manage. I think eventually, you, you realise what your own style of leadership is and you have to adopt that. Very hard being a leader, Rob, and not being authentic. You know, that, that means there can be nuances in how you lead compared to someone else, but you effectively have to be authentic. I also think leadership is quite situation-based. I mean, you have to know whether the leadership issue is around inspiring everyone or you know, making one really important correct call um, and guiding through that or um, reinserting yourself in a very material manner when previously you hadn't. So, you know, I find good leaders have a great combination of IQ, EQ, um, hard work. I haven't met too many leaders though that don't like people because Leadership, by definition, means you're working through people. So, you, ha you know, you do have to like people, and as a result, it means you need to be with people. I haven't met too many good leaders that aren't good listeners. As I said in the opening, you've had an extraordinarily diverse career. When you sit back and, and reflect on everything that you've achieved, what stands out as, as perhaps some of your proudest achievements? Look, haven't talked about it, but... I, I would probably still put my family as my proudest achievement. You, know, you can do many things on this on this earth, but a successful, loving um, family, uh, I I would still say is, you know, the, the pinnacle of success for probably all of us. In a career sense, Rob, look, you know, I I think I would say having done it the way I wanted to do it. I don't think I've left anything in the tank. I don't. I've just turned 60 and I don't look back and think, gee, you know, I should have done something I hadn't done or I missed out. You know, I've, I've had a ball. I've loved the way it's played out. It's been fun. I've had my successes, but I've had my failures. I've learnt from my failures. I've enjoyed my successes. Um, always good to have a few more successes than failures. Um, but, you know, you grow. You grow from both and you grow a lot more from your failures. I think that that would be the highlight. I've I've loved the, the way it's worked out for me, and I it's been a bespoke 
career, but it's worked. Still plenty of life left yet, both in your professional career and, and in your private life as well. Mark Barnaber, AM, it's been an absolute pleasure having you as part of the series. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Rob. It's been very enjoyable. I appreciate it.